uh, stream or those that are visiting the school today, uh, welcome to John Marshall Law School. Uh, we're very proud of our IP program uh, for good reason. It dates back to 1940, um, and we've been uh, leaders nationally and internationally since. In fact, this morning I was at a breakfast with the Minister of Education from the Czech Republic, where we even uh, discussed some of the programming that we've done with our IP center over there. Um, and this is just in addition to our very strong presence that we have in China as well. Um, the center also has a long history of hosting uh, great programs like what you're going to see today. Um, in the center, what I'm very proud of uh, personally, uh, the center also supports our mission of making sure that our students uh, are prepared for the practice of law. Um, as, as many know here, and for those that don't know, uh, we're one of the very few schools in the nation that have both a patent clinic and a trademark clinic that are certified by the UT, USPTO. Um, and that started, uh, our trademark clinic started last year, and it's now one of our most successful and popular clinics at the school. Um, we're also proud that many of the graduates of our program uh, go on to lead successful careers in the IP field, and I think it's because of the emphasis that we have both in uh, the intellectual atmosphere as well as our, our clinical program. Um, now we're excited because we're entering a new phase for our Center for Intellectual Property as we just recently announced and proudly announced that Daryl Lim is the new director of our center. Um, Professor Lim is a pro prolific scholar. He's an excellent teacher. He has published numerous articles and is the author of a widely respected book, Patent Misuse and Antitrust, Empirical, Doctrinal, and Policy Perspectives. Uh, we will miss his predecessor, Professor Doris Long, but we know that he will build upon her strong leadership and move the program to the next level. With all of this as a background, it is my pleasure to introduce our new director of the Center for Intellectual Property, Daryl Lim, who will introduce our guests today. Thank you, Anthony, and a warm good afternoon to everyone, and welcome to those of us uh, joining this event via live stream. Uh, the video recording of this event will be available uh, after the event. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to the inaugural uh, event uh, of this academic year. We thank you for your interest and also folks like uh, IP Watch Comparative, Patent Remedies, IP Watchdog, and Managing IP for their interest. Now we are on the record and you're very welcome to use social media but please silence your phones. Uh, our Twitter handle is hashtag GMLSIP. Now I want to start by thanking folks that have helped make this event possible. From GMLS, former Associate Dean uh, Ralph Rupner, Dean John Cockery, Associate Deans Anthony Nitwicki, Julie Spanbauer, and Assistant Dean uh, Teresa Doe, as well as Annie Krug, Michael Huggins, Peter Beck, Christine Crowley, Miller McDonald, Peggy Zimba, Dalian Voigt, Chantel Foley, Damera Diarova, Nina Campbell, Nicole Harriman, Eric Fergilis, and Lauren Prehoda. From Fordham, uh, Zachary Slates, Denisha Fernando, and Jessica Frederick. And we also want to thank Cooper and Dunham for the sponsors sponsorship of this live stream. So events of this quality can continue only with the support of folks like them. So if you'd like to support uh, future events like these, please speak to me or my associate director, Bill McGrath, sitting in front, and we'll be happy to chat further. Next, the conversation. Now, this conversation is important because of the subject itself. Our knowledge-based economy is based largely on intellectual property, and there's concern that any trust law could be the next uh, battlefront for IP skeptics. The battle is also taking place at an international stage with different jurisdictions jostling for influence over competition norms and best practices. It's also important because despite the high stakes involved, folks are talking past each other rather than talking to each other. Just last week, I saw this at a high level conference in DC involving patents, telecoms, and antitrust. Unmitigated, this sort of adversarial mentality could lead to a new type of Cold War. Uh, fortunately, many have decided also to engage rather than isolate. But the question then is how do we engage and does the US have a leadership role on the global stage in this regard? To consider these and other important questions, I'm delighted to have two of the brightest stars in the IP and antitrust constellation. I had the privilege of working with each of them. Uh, on my far right, I have Bill Kovacic, former chairman, commissioner, and general counsel 
winner of the uh, Patrick Award in 2011, returned to GW to head the Competition Law Center. Now he's a visiting professor of global competition law and policy at King's College London. Also the non-executive director to UK's Competition and Markets Authority. For more than 20 years, Bill has served the world as advisor on antitrust law and consumer protection to jurisdictions from Armenia to Zimbabwe, and I should add also to Singapore about 10 years ago, and that's about the time that I met Bill. That was also about the time that I met Hugh Hansen in Singapore. Hugh is known for his legal realist understanding of how courts, agencies, and the private sector interact with intellectual property law and with each other. In that vein, he founded the Fordham IP Conference, now in its 24th year, and the conference has been called the Davos of the IP world by the Director General of WIPO, and that's the World Intellectual Property Organization. Uh, Hugh has taught courses in antitrust law and advanced antitrust law. While he was in practice, he litigated against the Justice Department. He has been the lead counsel, consultant, and expert witness to uh, cases involving the US, the UK, Germany, and Poland. And Managing IP Magazine has named him on three occasions as one of the 50 most influential people in IP in the world. The Federal Circuit, through Chief, then Chief Judge Michel, gave him an award for his contribution to the legal community's understanding of international IP law. So clearly, two very distinguished, very well-qualified people to talk about the state of the world in IP and antitrust law. I'll now hand the floor to the two of them. Please join me in welcoming them. Uh, thank you very much, Daryl. And, and of course, Daryl is, is a relatively junior person, but he's made a tremendous splash in the academic world and the IP world and I congratulate you on that. And congratulating you on being named the uh, head of the center, IP Center here, which is, which is quite an achievement. And especially since John Marshall is known for IP and has been known for IP for many, many years, it's not just the center of IP, but the center of IP at John Marshall. Uh, today we're gonna have what's called a conversation, which means I, I'm hoping to say some stuff. Uh, and we, Bill and I are going to discuss this. Uh, Bill Kovacic, uh, uh, I'm one of his biggest fans. He's an incredible person, scholar, incredibly bright. He's done a tremendous amount of stuff and has a lot of ideas, interesting ideas, on what's right and what's wrong. Uh, to start off, I'm just, I'm, by the way, thank, I'm going to welcome, thank you for coming, and also for those by video, live or dead video. Uh, I don't think you'd call it dead streaming, do you? But it's, it's after the event streaming. Um, I thought I'd start off, oh, by the way, the, the, the Director General of WIPO did call Fordham uh, the Davos of IP, and I, I call Davos actually the Fordham IP <laughs> of economic. Uh, and uh, okay, IP, it started out, and when I started out, I, I was, IP before it was cool. Uh, and uh, it was really a boutique course in schools, basically New York, California, and Chicago were the only places you could teach it when I first started at Fordham. The entire IP curriculum uh, was in one two credit course. Uh, and that was typical of many schools that did not feature IP. Um, one of the reasons is there wasn't a, there weren't a lot of jobs in IP. It was relatively a very uh, uh, small economic footprint, uh, and you had people who made less money in copyright, for instance. Uh, but it was more of a calling. They want to be uh, with creators. I became interested in copyright. I wanted to be a novelist. I had no skill. Uh, that led me, though, to thinking and everything else, and I, I, I was very comfortable in, in the copyright world. Uh, it's similarly in patents, or patents and trademarks, are probably the thing that has been most um, similar is trademarks, because everyone has a trademark, all companies have a trademark. So the trademark bar has always been fairly substantial, and because of the need to litigate, 
they've had a bunch of people, but it's not less, it's not so much of a calling. If you think of college, when I went to college, there were the scientists on the hill, there were the copyright people who were philosophy, political science, and everything else, and the, and the trademark people were in fraternity row, having a good time and enjoying themselves, uh, and, and ending up making quite a bit of money. Uh, what changed, uh, uh, and I'll hit competition in a second, what changed was the portability of IP. Everyone had, if you went to an IP lawyer anywhere, all they knew was their own country. All of a sudden, we had video cassettes, audio cassettes, and American culture was doing what? Appealing to youth who for the first time were not doing what their parents did. Uh, and so tremendous marketplaces opened up, similarly with patents. So where it used to be the IP attorney in a firm was in a windowless office, now they became the IP you know, under the general counsel. A lot of money was being made, and that made it important. Everyone was happy. Everyone thought IP was good. There was not a big pushback by anybody. Then came the digital age. The digital age changed everything because of the ability to reproduce. And then with 3D printing, it's going to be even more problematic. But what it really did was make consumers economically interested in low IP protection. It was in their interest to be able to take things and not have to pay for it. And what built up around it uh, were people from the tech side. So when I was, it used to be the entire IP bar, was, or copyright bar certainly, were wannabe creators. It changed, the people who teach IP now come from the tech side. And tech people want to make the perfect machine, the perfect atom bomb or whatever. And whatever gets in the way of it is a problem. So the machine has to be the most efficient possible. But what gets in the way of a machine is IP. So the tech people are almost intrinsically against IP. And then you put on top of that people who are basically skeptical of property, uh, transfer of income, of value. Uh, then you have uh, various uh, NGOs who have a political or ideological view uh, of IP that is very negative. So what we had was everyone was small but happy. Now growing bigger, happy. Growing very big and everyone's miserable. Uh, we have wars going on. It's a very different environment. There's very different consensus about anything. Almost every issue you're going to have people on the opposite side. Uh, whether it's amicus briefs or, or, or whatever. Then you go to competition. Competition started out very small. It was antitrust. It was really distrust. It was populists who had distrust of big business. And how, how do we have distrust? We have distrust because we don't know the people. Same thing, immigration, all these issues. Uh, if you know people, you don't have distrust. Whether you, whatever issue you want to do, same-sex marriage, everything else, you get to know people, the differences disappear. And what made this country great was um, the melting pot. Everyone just became an American. When I was growing up, if you called someone Italian-American or anything else, you'd be punched. Everyone was just an American. Uh, so we had a thwart of the normal tribalism which divides. Okay. Today, all of that has come back, and we have almost tribalism in IP, whereas there's this group and that group, and it's ferocious, and there's very little agreement or even wanting to agree. And on top of that, what you have is very sophisticated people on social media against unsophisticated IP owners who are just used to saying, I like IP, why, I, I have a right to it. It's like, why are you Catholic or Protestant? You've never had to explain it before. It's like a natural right. It, it's John Locke. Effort creates property. Never before had to really be explained, and now how to explain in various situations. They almost are unable to do it, whereas the people on the other side are very articulate and able to use uh, to the disadvantage of IP owners. So we are in a precarious situation. Competition, not a, also boutique, but boutique in a sense of not intellectuals, but of business and trade. 
and it was very important. And so there's a lot of money tied to competition. So you had giants in competition law all throughout that can be mentioned. Um, the, what was the largest section in the ABA? What was the most effective section in the ABA for years and years and years was the antitrust section. And it had tremendous chair people and everything else, and it was intellectually stimulating uh, way back when and to up, up until now. So it has a history of being important, being thought of as important, and no interest in IP whatsoever. You talk, I worked in the antitrust division when I was at Georgetown for a year and a half as a student. Um, IP, you know, was, was not even something to discuss. If it was discussed at all, they had the nine no-nos, which is basically saying, if you own a patent, you can't use it. And that was just gospel. Uh, wherever you went with co competition people, it was not on the radar because commercially it was not important. They didn't have to address it. So now what we have is competition still continuing to be important, especially now when we're talking about international trade, U.S. trade representative, all these other issues. We're talking about the EU trying to have trade, internal markets, free movement of goods. Um, so that has actually gotten more important. So the law of competition law is very important. Law of IP is very important. For the first time, actually, in my view, competition people are having to address IP. Now, whether it's because of it's just injecting themselves, patent assertion entities, or whatever, they can't avoid it. And so what we have is more interplay uh, and perhaps some more respect. Uh, one example is Bill Baer, the uh, Assistant Attorney General of the Antitrust Division, he just in his talks is actually giving, I think, a, a very balanced view of IP and its value and everything else, which you probably never would have gotten out of the antitrust in, in the future. So what we have now to go through is, what is the future here abroad? Uh, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? What can we do? And we have a number of topics which was in the brochure. So to start off, former chair of the FTC, We'll deal with the role of antitrust agencies. Uh, let me let me start, uh, Hugh, by you got the thing by on thanking uh, both you and Daryl for the opportunity to do this. Uh, as as Daryl suggested, and uh, with no exaggeration at all, um, Hugh's been directly responsible for providing a forum that overcomes the limitations of disciplinary tunnel vision. And in many ways, I'd say that Hugh has done more in the past quarter century to create a community in which these issues can be discussed. I don't think I have to work hard to persuade all of you that a crucial element of the success of any body of law is an intellectual infrastructure that supports debate, research, and analysis. Uh, and it's a, a real treat to be here with, with someone who, uh, more than any other in our country, uh, has built that uh, community and network. Uh, and likewise, uh, to be here with Daryl uh, and, and his, his law school at George Mar uh, John Marshall, uh, to such a great degree, uh, Derek's, Derek's, uh, uh, Daryl's the, the hope for a good future. And when you see his work, uh, you see that uh, the work all of us have done, the collective efforts to develop the field are in very good hands for the future. Uh, the competition agencies, as, as Hugh said, uh, in focusing on the Department of uh, Justice and the Federal Trade Commission at the national level um, have developed an increasingly sophisticated and nuanced approach to this field. Uh, Hugh's right. If you go back uh, 40 years, you would not have seen top Department of Justice leadership speaking in a balanced, nuanced way about the relationship between the two fields. Uh, this audience knows about the seven uh, no-nos. And it's, uh, it's 1977, I believe, that Bruce Wilson at the Department of Justice gave the fam famous speech uh, in which he laid out uh, severe Department of Justice concerns about anything that seemed to be a restricted practice in, in the licensing of intellectual property. It was a tradition of considerable hostility that showed up not only in speeches but in enforcement uh, practice. So much so that the typical antitrust person in speaking the word patent almost felt an automatic obligation to follow it with the words monopoly, uh, as though the words patent monopoly were hyphenated and were forever linked together. 
uh, with Monopoly having a sinister meaning and concern in the field of competition law. Um, we're a long way from that, and that's a, that's a decided uh, demonstration of, of progress. Uh, key turning point, the 1995 uh, Department of Justice, FTC, Intellectual Property Antitrust Guidelines. Uh, but since then, uh, to take all the speeches that have come from the front office, from the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice, uh, a macro feature that appears in all of those speeches is a recognition of the importance of protecting intellectual property rights as one way to develop an effective, vibrant economy. And a decided tendency across the two agencies to refer to competition law and patent law as complements. Uh, to speak of IP and antitrust as complements that share the common goal of promoting innovation, growth, productivity, enhancement that come from that. That's a, that's a big step forward over 40, 40 oh, yeah, years ago. Yeah. Um, is it good enough? Uh, I, I'd say in many ways you can look to, to, to signs of progress, uh, but I'm not sure in the, in the modern environment that it's, that, it's, that it's quite what it should be. Um, just to look at the two agencies, there are, there are a number of reasons why you could applaud uh, a decision to have two agencies. And my sense is that uh, our system is hardwired for a variety of reasons that it would take an extraordinary external shock, uh, some calamitous development uh, to impel the United States to take its two national competition authorities and merge them into one. Let me ask you one question. Sure. If there was an antitrust division, first, and it was second, would there ever have been an FTC? If the Supreme Court had issued the Standard Oil decision the way they did, I think we would have had something like the FTC, because that, to, this, to, to Congress, uh, the, standard, the element of Standard Oil in which the court says every contract and restraint of trade is condemned really means every unreasonable con contract and restraint of trade. Uh, that editing of the text uh, set off such alarms in the Congress uh, that this court was willing to bend the words of the statute to its own will. And its, in ru its routine interpretation of decisions uh, was going to do the same thing in ways that tended to narrow the reach of the statute, makes its, make its application more ambiguous that probably would have been a catalyst for Congress to decide they wanted their own policy instrument. Uh, but certainly a more, having, having, having the antitrust division established as a true institutional body would have made that choice more difficult for Congress. But I, I, th I think what, 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 what's, what's uh, uh, a question of concern is whether, whether we have adequate policy integration between the two agencies. Uh, uh, they each have a keen interest in topics such as standard essential patents, the availability of injunctions as remedies for infringement where you have what is, what is said to be a, a, a willing licensee. To a bar remarkable degree, if you assume that you're not going to have integration by merger, we're not going to put them together, in part for the reason Hugh just mentioned, the executive branch is not going to give up its tool, the Congress is not going to give up its tool. And it's hard to imagine what would cause them to do that. But let's assume we're not going to integrate by merger. Well, the alternative is what economists would call integration by contract, which calls for a deeper degree of integration of policymaking between the two. Um, and I, I confess error from my own time at the FTC on, on this. Uh, I did no better than anybody else. Uh, but we're left with uh, our agencies that, in a sense, are engaged in a reluctant joint venture. They cooperate as needed. Uh, they upgraded the 2010 merger guidelines. Um, but there is a, a reluctance to engage in a willing, full-fledged integration of effort, which would lead to, for example, uh, the development of a common approach to IP, where you have common working groups, you have a common process of discussing what the agencies regard as priorities, a common plan of carrying them out, and yes, God forbid, things such as sharing texts in advance of speeches, so you can discuss what goes on, what might be said at home and abroad. Uh, and I think, that, I think that deeper integration is crucial to develop more effective and coherent policies at home, uh, but increasingly, if you want to have an effective role in shaping global standards, in shaping 
international understandings of what have to be done, it puts a premium on having policy coherence at home uh, because the U.S. at one time was a true monopolist in antitrust policy. Uh, that's changed over the last 25 we'll years. We'll discuss that. Yeah. Let me ask you this. To what extent uh, the agent, and we'll get to DG competition in a second, to what extent does the FTC or the antitrust effectiveness depend on who is the head of it, which is a point, that person appointed by the president. Is it such a body of bureaucracy competition has, what, 200, 300 people in the FTC, and I trust has, I don't know, 400 or something. Um, does it really matter who's appointed, or does this just keep moving, or can individuals make a big difference? The fact that you have a substantial professional technical team in both law and economics means that in many ways the agencies continue to function in a roughly similar way across the leadership of different individuals. Uh, uh, in other words, even if the captain changes, the ship keeps moving in a certain direction because of its institutional momentum, its professional staff. Um, and as a footnote, that professional staff at those agencies is much better today than it was uh, 25, 35 years ago, 25, I wish, 35 years ago when I was a kid at the Federal Trade Commission for the first, first time. So these agencies uh, are envied around the world for their professional skill. Um, they keep moving in many ways in certain directions regardless of who's chair. But the identity of the captain matters a lot. Uh, it accounts for the broad strategic choice of policy initiatives. Uh, um, the fact that the FTC moved into the IP area in the 1990s and 2000s was unmistakably a choice made by Bobotovsky and Tim Muris. Two academics, by the way, who'd spent their lifetime studying some of these issues. Two academics who looked over the landscape of issues that seemed to be important and said, we need to devote more attention to these issues, including trying to build a, a sense, of, sense of community. Um, there's a huge difference in Washington be between having someone who takes the job because they're happy to have the job and people who take the job because they want to do something with the job. Uh, and uh, to take the, the example of Potofsky and Muris, who in the 90s and into the aughts commonly develop an interest in this area and propel the agency in the direction of devoting more resources and, quite important, I think, investing and building knowledge that would not necessarily reward them in the short term but would be important for the agency in the future. Uh, so uh, uh, while, while you have a, a, a professional technical team that would continue to do certain things regardless of who's in charge, um, uh, the choice of leadership is, is, is unquestionably important. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of the hugest stakes uh, that citizens have in this country uh, when presidents and legislators sit down to decide jointly uh, who's going to be in charge of the agencies. Yeah, one example of huge difference in academics. Academics don't always bring exciting and fresh blood. Sometimes... Uh, Sometimes they fall right on their faces. Yeah, like Turner... Uh, Rita and Turner, Turner was a Harvard professor, so was a reader. They had the magnificent treatise on uh, competition law, and he was uh, uh, appointed to the, the assistant attorney general. And it was a very stagnant time. There was a lot of things going on, but it was more status quo. He's very bright and had a lot of theories of what could be done, but in that role, you, you don't have the power necessarily to, have to implement those theories. It's Whereas Richard McLaren, who was a Chicago lawyer, chair of the ABA antitrust section, came in. It was gangbusters. In his three short years, he went after conglomerate mergers, which never thought antitrust was a problem. Conglomerate merger is where, you know, I'm uh, Buick and I have a clothing line. It has nothing to do with anything else I've done. So the normal things of impeding competition are very hard to figure out. He came up with a scheme to do it. Uh, he also came up with things which almost caused him to be uh, burned alive. I mean, he came up, I think, with the theory of intracorporate conspiracy, of the parent company conspiring with a subsidiary to be a Section 1 violation, 
which did not go over very well. Um, but it, it was amazing to see someone come in and actually create a, a real change and discussion about uh, IP. I, I agree. I agree entirely, Hugh. I think the pure academic uh, who does not have some real intuition about management uh, is not in some basic way a political scientist as well, uh, but is largely a product entirely of the Tower of Ivory and has lived there forever is, uh, is, is going to have a tough time being effective in those jobs. And, and, and Petoskey and Muris I hold out as, as, as examples of a, of, a, of a different attitude. They'd both been at the FTC before. They'd been students of government. Um, they'd been in an arena in which they'd been knocked around a lot in difficult policy-making debates. And so they come back to the agency to be chair after they've had a long body of experience with the agency. And, and that gives you the intuition uh, to choose programs and to decide how to shape them, package them, and pursue them effectively. Uh, and in many ways, that's, that's the sweet spot of capabilities. Uh, but they were, they were more than just academics. They were academics who had seen theory meet practice in a very informative way. Okay, uh, I've got a little note from uh, Professor Lim. Uh, Shut up and do what is on the list, I think is what he said. But uh, uh, so we'll try to do, try to do more of that. Uh, all right, so we're going to talk a little about international. Uh -huh. You've got DG Comp, you've got China. Those are two big players. Uh, DG Competition, Directorate General Competition, it's one of, I don't know, about 21 directorates uh, in the European Commission. Uh, my experience with them is very high quality people and very much go-getters. Uh, we want to make a difference. I've had two matters before them, and it was both pleasant experiences. Uh, I was actually trying to get them to do something against someone else, which is another thing that happens in Europe and rarely here, right? I don't know if the FTC actually has, I come in and complain about a competitor. Does it get those complaints? Oh, uh, yeah, a lot. They're, they're just not listened Ignored. to quite as keenly as they would be in Brussels. Yeah. And uh, so they have, their own policy, which is, you might say, wrong. Uh, or to use a neutral assessment. A yeah. neutral assessment, but maybe yeah. overly aggressive yeah. uh, in some areas. But I've, I, mean, I can agree yeah. with, actually, a lot of it, but some of it. What do you think? Give, it, give us a, a quick sketch of DG competition. Well, for, for a long time, I was suggesting before that the world of competition law was a monopoly, and that was yeah. the US. Um, in the late 80s when DG Comp, uh, when Europe adopts the merger control regulation, it becomes a duopoly. Uh, a duopoly in which in some areas uh, the, the Europeans now lead the United States in shaping global norms. And single firm conduct is, is one of them. Uh, the European jurisprudence is uh, more favorable for intervention. Uh, the perspective and attitude of the enforcers, the very capable enforcers, is one that's more doubting uh, that their economy is resilient enough uh, to adapt uh, in the face of uh, the departure of firms, which would be less significant or concerning in the United States. Um, and what we have now is that if you ask, if you ask which competition authority in the world is the most influential and most important with respect to establishing global norms and setting global standards for single firm behavior, it is unmistakably the European Union. Yeah, yeah, the, U, the U.S. Yeah. in many ways is not part of that debate anymore. Yeah, I think, I think it's actually very good when I said, obviously, there's a joke wrong. They have a lot of good things to say. One emphasis they have, I found out, Europe and the DG COP is much less concerned with some horizontal canoodling of business. Because I would bring up, you know, by the way, in a different this, this could lead to, Hugh, uh, we don't worry about that that much. The more interested, the not disinterested, but the more interested in single firm conduct. I'd say, I'd say they, uh, after the, the, the vitamins cartel was unmasked in the 1990s, uh, yeah, Europe became more keenly interested in cartels, and their collective fines now uh, sort of match euro for euro, dollar for dollar, what the Department of Justice gets now. It was, uh, it was an embarrassment to see a long-standing cartel run for, for, for over a decade and a half under their own noses. So I'd say, I'd say one norm that you see globally adopted now is that cartels are bad, but 
on dominant firm behavior, uh, to look at the EU menu of cases in litigation in the pipeline now, to compare that to what you see today in the US agencies. Uh, it is a stunning difference with uh, Europe not only leading the way, but there's a real element of institutional pride in that too. Yeah, uh, yeah I think, yeah. yeah, obviously cartels, uh, horizontal, horrible. Yeah. I'm thinking more of in the US, you, th you have to tell clients, they're gonna go to a meeting about this or that, don't discuss price if the price is discussed spill something and leave the room, all these other things. It's much less of that. Uh, DG Comp or others concerned about that sort of sort of spillover, maybe some things, but um, China. Yeah, the, the duopoly that I referred to before is now becoming an oligopoly. Uh, China established, uh, China's competition system went live in uh, 2008 and China has established its system and made its mark faster than any other jurisdiction in the history of competition law since Canada adopted the first national law in 1889. Uh, it has been a breathtaking process of development. One example, abusive dominance case involving Qualcomm, uh, a fine uh, of nearly a billion US. Uh, it, uh, it took the other agencies around the world a long time to get to close to a billion, China got there in uh, in, 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 under, in barely six years. Well, they're just greedy. Um, yeah, a question that gets posed about competition agencies generally is that are they too fond of the big round number? A nice attractive round number that people people understand around the world. Uh, but I, but I, China, China has, certainly for merger control, but increasingly for single firm behavior, uh, you cannot discuss the you cannot have the conversation about who matters, who puts their mark on the world, whose laws demand your attention in business planning. Uh, if you're an international enterprise, uh, China's has to be on your list now. And, and acquiring still more skill, power, and influence. And the interesting question for US policymakers is, in a world where you cannot compel others to abide by your preferences, and, and, it's, and it's the US, EU, and China now. It will be Brazil. Uh, it could very well be India, uh, right around the corner too. So you'll have five major players. You'll have regional alliances, perhaps ASEAN, that at some point within the decade uh, seek to assert the same kind of policy prerogatives in big economies uh, like, uh, like Indonesia. Um, the point is that the, the US ability to set standards through its own actions and efforts is waning. The only way that you will set standards, get people to accept your preferences, sometimes in trade agreements, but basically is through persuasion, uh, because none of these other countries has to do what you think is good policy. And China is a great example of a country now that is every bit as serious in barely seven years of activity every bit as serious in many ways as the U.S. and Brussels. Uh, let me make uh, two points about that. One is I think competition, that's true. And one of the reasons is it's more aggressive and they can go after single firms. And a lot of those single firms are foreign single firms. And it coincides with the idea of stopping f foreign competition. But in, actually in IP, uh, China is looking at the U.S. model, both in copyright and others. Japan, which is supposed to be looking at Germany for IP because of historical reasons, look, looks at U.S. So I think, uh, why? Because they think it works. Wh the question is, when you think about a country, what are they going to do with the law? What are they going to do with that competition law? If you're going in and think they're going to apply it fairly, but you're a foreigner and, they're at, uh, and there's a domestic company, you may be in trouble regardless of what's going on. Uh, but that is not, you know, we are lucky, both in Europe and, and here, there's very little of that going on. But in the rest of the world, there's a lot of that going on. Well, in, in the, uh, certainly one policy impulse that led to the, the adoption of China's law was, uh, was a concern that, as a matter of law, Chinese institutions lacked a good platform to deal with what they thought were excessive pricing terms for licenses for IP. Uh, and that the anti-monopoly law would be a tool to help redress that. Uh, the, the law itself has a number of provisions that speak to advancing broad industrial policy concerns of the People's Republic. So if you were to ask a Chinese specialist, um, were IP licensing terms 
was the rough balance of authority and power between those who hold rights and those who seek licenses, was that a focal point, a focal point behind the development of the law? They would say, obviously and absolutely it was. Uh, so uh, there, there, there is, uh, there, there's unabashedly a component there of uh, rebalancing relationships uh, that the Chinese government thought, was, uh, thought were, were, were out of line. Uh, the interesting thing looking ahead is uh, to what extent uh, uh, the law gradually is adapted to become a, a, an instrument uh, uh, that has a great deal of neutral application built into it. Uh, uh, a number of companies that are the targets of Chinese cases now are, are, are indeed Chinese companies as well, uh, not uh, simply foreign firms, uh, although, although if you ask, compared to, say, Washington, or perhaps even compared to Brussels, is, is Beijing a place to go if you want to interest a government agency in an abuse case? Uh, the answer is, is probably yes. And in, in short, North American companies and European companies are using techniques that were developed, for example, in Brussels. Third-party complainants coming in and saying, do something. Um, that skill and that lobbying capacity and capability is now migrating to Beijing. So you see uh, that, that type of strategy being played out. Why? Because the enforcement platform and the enforcement framework is more, more favorable for intervention. And the Chinese will point out to you, lots of the tools we're using are tools that were tested in North America or in Europe. And one in particular they point to is the European uh, Article 102 provision that deals with excessive pricing. Uh, and if you ask the Chinese, well, why are you intervening and scrutinizing these licensing terms? Well, the Europeans do it. It's there. Yeah, but they have that, but they rarely use it. Uh, but but they, don't, they don't walk away from it. Uh, that is, uh, they, the, the European approach to it is, is, I would call it, say, ambiguous. Uh, that is, the recognition, yes, it's there. Yes, it's the law. Yes, it can be used. And at the member state level, a number of the member states do use it. Um, you're, they're in the difficult position of saying it's there, it's effective, but its application should be nuanced. But it's very difficult to sell someone else. You shouldn't be doing this well, either. Well, uh, the, the whole EU system and competition came into effect uh, in the 50s, and what they looked to was the U.S. Warren Court approach, which was basically anti-IP. And if you look at the whole EU, the courts, advocate generals, everything, Everything was really anti-IP. It was the problem. It was a monopoly. It was the problem. It wasn't until the EU itself passed copyright laws or is doing things with patents or do something else. As soon as the commission and the others said, okay, this, then you see a change in the courts or, or the commission. But the laws are still there that can be used. And one of the problems with Europe is they have all these member state competition authorities who can take this. For instance, a good example is the Microsoft case, which everyone considers is fairly broad. And I'll discuss that in a second. Commission will never do that again. That was a freak of nature. What happened is it was going to be settled. The whole civil service, which is brilliant, had worked out a settlement with Microsoft. The Dutch commissioner, on her own, like a day before the settlement was going to be signed, said, I'm, we're going to sue them. It was really panic. was afraid it was so far out that they wouldn't be able to get it past the general court or court first instance and they'd lose the credibility of ever going after anyone again. It was really close. In that case, um, 13 judges, it was seven, it was seven, six. And the seven, and then how do we know this? because the individual judges and the president of the gen general court was so upset with the result and what the commission had done. They got the seven votes because the commission said, basically, we're dead unless we win this case. An American company, we lose to them. We're not gonna, we're gonna lose face with the rest of Europe. Yeah, but, you're, playing, you're playing for the institutions of the yeah. community. But, so you look at that case and say, well, that's the law. No, there are people hiding in the bushes. They're waiting for the next case from the commission that's going to try to build on that, and they're going to go, and they're going to, they're going to lose. Um, so it's, um, 
fascinating that the non ideological or whatever things can get involved in that. And there's one wo one woman who made a difference. Very strong willed uh, created that situation. Um, okay, how do you talk uh, to agencies to be effective for your client? What is approaches? What other things can you do? Do you have any thoughts on that? I think one thing that I, I see happening in a number of instances, certainly going back to my time on the commission, is that firms are more and more departing from an older model of government relations. The older model used to be that uh, you waited until the fire started, then you brought out the trucks to go and put it out. So that much of your effort to go see the agencies to deal with them was crisis driven. I think more and more companies are coming to realize that's too late. That what you want to do is to have a continuing conversation with them about things that are important to you. Um, if you're a commercial enterprise that has a major high-tech presence that's built on, uh, on, on, on a patent portfolio, uh, you want to go see the regulators periodically just to talk about what you're doing. Here are our product lines, here are developments uh, related to the larger competitive environment. Uh, these are basically get-to-know-you sessions in which you're trying to educate about your business model, how it's developing, the role that IP plays, why it's important to what you're doing, um, not in the context of a specific investigation or matter. Uh, and essentially what you're trying to do is teach. These are little seminars. And I noticed that more and more companies, certainly while I was at the commission, uh, are not sending in relatively junior people. They're sending in the senior leadership to do this. That is, they're sending in people from the front office. They're bringing the CEO. They're bringing the chief of operations. They're bringing their chief technologist. They're bringing the people whom the members of the commission would easily realize from a casual reading of the pages of the business press. One way to describe these is that these are debiasing vi visits. That is, you, you look to see where the agencies might be forming a view that is hostile to your interests or skeptical, and you want to get in there early before those initial views harden into firm and difficult to well, change Google's views. Google's a perfect example of this. Uh, Google's a great example uh, of an institution that, uh, even though it was the subject of a long, intensive investigation on the part of the FTC, Google's a good example of an enterprise uh, that was in, in to see the FTC well before the FTC opened up that file. And of course, not just because of competition law, but because of the, for Google, deadly serious business about what global privacy norms are going to look like, which, which for a competition lawyer to say this, I, I, I regard this as a serious admission. Uh, data protection and privacy is the real regulatory issue globally for the future for these companies. It is not antitrust law. Uh, um, I suspect if whatever happens to Google in Europe, uh, we probably will never again see a company that might be so blasé of writing it as writing a check for five billion euros if it had to. Uh, an irritant, uh, they'd rather keep it, but uh, but they could do that. If their model on privacy is transformed, that's a different matter altogether. But yes, Google's a good example. Uh, same thing I would say of Facebook. Same thing I would say of Apple. And I think, I think the nature of effective representation in Washington is no longer to wait until the house is on fire. Okay. You want to be out there. You want to be out there, there sooner. You want a regular process of visits to say, I just want to let you know okay. what's going on in the house. Okay, let's talk about a smaller firm and the house is on fire, uh, and then before the FTC. Is it basically once the FP, FTC, by the way, does the commission still vote on whether to start uh, the investigation or not? Uh, the commissioners have to vote to issue what is called compulsory process. Those are subpoenas, basically. All right, so, so they were criticized, actually, by the Department of Justice and others that Maybe they shouldn't do that because they're all sort of prejudging the whole thing before they hear all the evidence. I um, never prejudged. I had an absolutely neutral, truth seeking attitude that enabled me to put aside those concerns. That's when right. I acted in an adjudication and prosecutorial capacity, I compartmentalized in my mind those issues completely, so I never prejudged. Yeah, it was always a, balanced, sensible decision making. That's why it's a tragedy. Just want to be clear about that. It is clear now. It's a tragedy that you left. 
Yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. With other people who might not. So, well, I'm yeah, so we're talking firm, about other individuals. A smaller yes. firm. Is it like once you issue that or anything else, is it, is it like I'm a tuna in the net waiting, waiting to be chopped up and eaten? Or can I be a shark and bite my way out of the net and actually avoid... If you, if you have some resources, you can bite your way out of the net. Um, Google's a good example of a, a, a non-minnow that bit its way out of the net uh, with the FTC. Google on search ultimately stared down the FTC and said, we'll give you some other concessions for other things, but if you want anything on search, you're going to have to get it in court. That means you're going to have to litigate from it, either through your internal process or through the federal courts, but one way or another, it's going to be a federal judge that mandates anything you get on search. Maybe you'll win, but try your luck. Um, I do think, by the way, Hugh, I think a, you know, a, 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 a condition that the FTC and the European Commission have to work every day of the week to, to, to deal with is the one you mentioned. Uh, this is an integrated decision-making model where the people who decide to prosecute are the same people in an adjudication capacity are in the position to decide whether there was an infringement. And despite my uh, comical recitation of my own wonderful ability to put these aside, in most areas of the law, we're skeptical of a model that entrusts both of those functions to the same decision makers, and with pretty good reason. Now, are there safeguards in place that tend to discipline the FTC a lot? Yes, the defendant in the administrative process sits to go to the Court of Appeals of their choice. That means in planning litigation, the FTC has to count for the jurisdiction within the US that is going to be the most skeptical of government intervention. That's a discipline. Uh, there are, and, and the courts are pretty good at picking up whether they think the kangaroos have made a bad decision inside of the court. But, but, uh, but I think, I think in, in, in both instances, it puts, a, it puts a huge burden on those institutions to do things in a way uh, that, uh, that in fact assures a neutral and rigorous assessment of the, the facts. But for a small firm, a small firm that marshals facts and most important is able to dispute the key assumptions on which the agency has premised the investigation and behind that has a good mapping out of where the law is and on abusive dominance law in the US, monopolization, it is, it is decidedly pro-defendant. If you have some resources to fight, it is a credible threat to look at the FTC commissioners and say, bring it on. Uh, you, you, you're, you're familiar with the geography of Washington where the FTC building is. It's the bow of the ship on the Federal Triangle. And it's looking up the street at the Congress and to the left on Constitution Avenue, around the corner, you can just see the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia, including the Court of Appeals. A firm that is willing, if it's done the right diagnosis of the law, and it's done a careful assessment of the facts, a powerful rhetorical argument for that firm that has real traction in practice is to point out the window to those commissioners sitting at the big desk, and you say, See that court? That's where we're going ultimately when you run your administrative process. We're going to the DC Circuit. That's the court that shoved your teeth down your throat in Rambus. Remember that? We're going to the same court. And if it doesn't work there, look up the street. This time of year, as the leaves fall off the trees in Washington, you can see just above the Senate building, you can see the peak of the Supreme Court building. You can see it from the office I was in on the fifth floor of the FTC. There it is. You say, that's where we're going next. And if you're willing to fight, and I realize that is a difficult bet. You've got to spend the money. You've got to litigate. But that is a credible threat for the commission because it knows that that journey has not always been successful. Well, one of the things is most clients don't want to spend that money, and I hear the Supreme Court they completely freak out that this thing will end up in the Supreme Court in terms of expense. But they're on a, basically, this is my budget, this is everything else, and I think you do have to convince. Look, we want to, if you, do we want to win this? Then what we do is actually we create the record not for the commission. And this is in a district court. You don't create the record for the district court. You create the record for the Court of Appeal. The narratives and everything else that are going to appeal to the Court of Appeals. Or a jury trial uh, if you're in district court. And that has how you litigate the case, and they'll see that. 
well, see, because I clerked in the Southern District and Second Circuit, the judges can perceive that you're thinking of an appeal. And whether they want to say it or not, the last thing they want is an appeal. For one is you can get reversed, but two, my God, this thing will come back. And I don't want to get rid of cases. So uh, it's a very important thing to keep in mind and uh, try to convince the client that this is basically your strategy. I see in the clock on the wall, now look at Daryl. Does he look like he's incredibly upset and mad? Look how well he is hid I, that. He looks Not placid, enough, placid, enthralled, and happy to me. Yeah, but anyway, uh, I think uh, we can. Oh, you're yeah. going to monitor the yeah, questions. Yeah, we're opening okay. up the questions. We have some time for questions and comments. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your arm. Wait to be acknowledged. State your name, affiliation. Make sure that it's a question or comment that's not too confessional. We tend to get quite a bit of that sometimes here. Yeah? Okay, gentleman in front. Oh, Mike. And, and name just, and just, just wait for the mic. Jeff oh, hold, hold, no, Jeff, hold on, because we're having the uh, live streaming, so we want the folks on the internet to be able to hear you too. Not for the internet, I'm afraid. Go, go ahead. Yeah, you oh, okay, could. Okay, no, no. Uh, yeah, that's you could. You, could, you can appear before us, Jeff. Oh. Go ahead. Plan B. Don't turn the red light on. Yeah. No. <laughs> Only if we don't like the question. So, Professor Kavasek talked about the words antitrust and monopoly almost being historically a uh, hyphenated uh, <coughs> word. And that led, that tension between the antitrust law and monopoly led to scope of the patent as being sort of the test. In fact, the nine no no's, the famous nine no no's, really were scope of the patent. You can't ask for. Uh, uh, royalties after the patent expired. You can't include another product that's not patented. Those are all part of the nine no-nos. Then you had Scalia's uh, opinion in the uh, Trinko, uh, Verizon versus Trinko case, which said monop monopoly is a good thing. And yep. then you had independent ink. The Supremes finally said that, uh, uh, that a patent is not necessarily a monopoly. And then finally, you had the Supremes in the activist case uh, sort of perhaps Jetson scope of the patent as being a test. Where does that, that progression, uh, where does that leave antitrust and IP now? I mean, I, I would think uh, perhaps taking those cases uh, perhaps in slightly different directions. Uh, uh, if I were a IP practitioner and I was uh, as an enthusiastic supporter of a broad notion of IP protection and narrow operation of the competition laws, um, I might name my kids Trinco and Independent Inc. Uh, because, uh, and indeed years from now, if you see children named Trinco, first name Trinco, you'll know what their parents do for a living. Uh, because uh, in many ways, it's a, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rough way of telling the competition, uh, agent, competition system to back off. Uh, it is solicitous of uh, uh, monopoly profits as an inducement for firms to enter the market and to, to spend and invest. Uh, and to the extent that Trinco is saying um, when, when competition law seeks to intervene in the operation of a collateral regulatory regime, which could be the patent system, uh, it ought to be very careful. And indeed, in some instances, it might be ousted from uh, exerting a significant role of oversight where the court has confidence that that collateral regulatory regime is functioning in a, in a, in a suitable way. So if I were an IP lawyer and I was an antitrust skeptic, I'd love Trinco, I'd, I'd be happy with Independent Inc. to see the Supreme Court finally say a patent is not immediately a source of market power. It is not invariably a source of monopoly profits. Uh, I, if I were an IP lawyer who has had a triumphant view of the IP system, I would say, uh, as Eartha Kitt did, at last uh, that it's done. Um, activists is... When, when did she say that? Um, she, she wasn't talking about competition law. She oh. was... She did, she did sing it. Uh, she was singing about something else, but not competition law. There aren't very many good competition law or antitrust movies or songs out there. Not, not many. 
Um, yeah, nor about Washington. No one's written a song called uh, Autumn in Washington, April in Washington, I Left My Heart in Washington, A Nightingale Sang in McPherson Square. Nobody's written those songs. Bill, Bill, Bill. Yeah. You're, you're um, actually, but, you see that clock yeah. up there? Darryl. Yes. But, but uh, activists, activists, activists arguably uh, uh, leads in a somewhat different direction. Uh, the 11th Circuit, uh, the foundational decision in shearing uh, was I would say very rough shove at the antitrust system saying back off uh, that the real test would be whether the behavior at issue took place within the scope of the, of, the, of, the, of the patent itself and that only in extraordinary circumstances could competition law override that. Uh, activists is uh, much more cautioning on that point, uh, saying not quite so. So uh, the first two, Trinco Independent Inc., uh, in a rough way of saying, Pro sympathetic to concerns that might arise on the part of a of a of a of a, of a patent uh, patent law enthusiast act antitrust back off activists uh, competition uh, antitrust lawyers would have more to like there than not to like. Okay, hold uh, on. Do you have any? Yeah, go ahead. I was going to ask whether you something to add to that. Go, well, I have two, but go ahead. No, no, that was my that was my question. Uh, yeah, first of all, forget about. Uh, a doctrine and cases. The judges don't care about that, all right? They want the good guy to win. So what you do is you, the way you argue a case, of course you need doctrine. But the reason we got activists was not because of doctrine. The reason we got any of those was not because of doctrine. is because judges on a particular time thought that this result was proper. At the district court level, it's good guy, bad guy. They got one clerk themselves working on it. They're administering everything else. They don't have time to go deeply into it. They can see a good guy and a bad guy. So what you do is you create the narrative. Um, I am not, you know, Pat, you say, this is not a monopoly. This is a property right. It's like, Your Honor, if you, you, what, I have a property right in a patent. I don't have a monopoly. It's like saying you have a monopoly in your car. It makes no sense. It's just a property right that doesn't give any sort of power. What gives the power is success in the marketplace. And that's what is the basis of this case. Success in the marketplace that other people want to mess around with. So the, you, you and it's a, it's a good guy. I'm, he's not anti-competitive or they're not anti-competitive. And you make that case, which is very much almost like a jury argument to a sophisticated people. Once they buy that, the doctrine comes easily. Look at activists. Activists is a situation where it was a 6-3 decision. What, three or four federal courts, there was only one that went the same way in the Third Circuit. Uh, and all there, they're waiting, actually out there, thinking activists is wrong. Uh, I'm the dis look at the district court judges. The district court judge in the Third Circuit has just thrown out two of these things because of the pleading. Uh, why? Because previously thought the scope of the pan was that's, that's what should be allowed. So because the Supreme Court in that decision, and especially Breyer, who was considered bright, the trouble of being bright, you're often too bright and wrong. And he's actually another judge. If you're looking at precedents in the Supreme Court and what they're likely to follow in the future, it's not, it's not Breyer. Breyer, as you see, his opinions are full of, oh, of course, we're not overruling this, we're not overruling this. That's because other justices are saying, what the hell are you doing? And so what, what, what it comes down to, it, it is a decision which gets the result but isn't necessarily going to say what's going to happen on the next case. So you look at the exceptions, we're not meaning this, and you look at the dissent, that probably has more votes than actually what Breyer does. But in, you know, even if it was 9-0, it wouldn't matter. If I'm, in, if I'm in a court of appeals or if I'm in a district court and I'm going to have to let a bad guy go or I'm in a court of appeals and I reach this decision and the Supreme Court says you're wrong, why do I care about that? I mean, if, what is stare decisis? It's a Latin phrase. Why am I a judge? I'm a judge because I know what I'm doing. We all thought about this is a good thing. They never do this. What do they know about patents? What do they know about this? What do they know about antitrust? We do more of that than they do. So what it comes down to then is I know I'm not going to be reversed or anything I do in this because the Supreme Court doesn't police these decisions. It takes the first one and then pretty much lets it go for years before it takes it. Now, Federal Circuit is a little different because they had yeah. some trouble with them. But so I am a court of appeals. I'm going to get away with a lot. 
before the Supreme Court does anything. So I'm suggesting to you that you look at what, especially if that circuit had a district court and a court of appeals doing the same thing, it's a pretty good indication of strong policy view about the case. And that you can look to. And then what does that mean? Form shopping. You certainly form shopping. Very, very important. There's, as, as Hugh said, there's lots of running room in activists to form presumptions that are, would either be pro-plaintiff or pro-defendant in these cases. And I, I think it's inevitable that at some point uh, the issue gets back to the court to spell out in more detail what it had in mind by way of a reasonableness an analysis going ahead. All right, thank you. Next question. And we do have the mic working now. We have two hours left, so take your time. By the way, there is a, a wine uh, reception following this, but the doors are locked. We're not leaving until the question period is over. Do you want to rebuild the outline? No. No, it's a good question, Bill. I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure I don't have any uh, inside insight into what was motivating that. I think that there is a growing view that whatever did motivate the choice in a matter such as this, it would be very good practice in this area and others to have a common program to go back after the fact and look and ask your question and use that as a basis for uh, an after-the-fact assessment of the initial choice. What's required for that um, is not necessarily an elaborate econometric study of, uh, of, uh, of actual effects, but, but something as basic as saying it's incumbent upon you, the prosecu prosecutor, to spell out very carefully what assumptions you're making in intervening. Uh, probably to articulate those to outsiders, but to have a careful statement of what you meant to do and at a suitable time afterwards to come back at that and say, how did these assumptions prove, play out? Your assumptions about entry, your assumptions about expansion, your assumptions about uh, uh, new technology developments, uh, how did that map out against what actually happened? As you know, one of, the, one of the greatest concerns about competition policy making in dynamic sectors is that it lacks the ability to look intelligently ahead, which is what was required in the Google Books matter, wasn't it? To make uh, judgments about the future in a, in a fast moving commercial arena. Uh, this is a complaint about antitrust that goes back to the early part of the 20th century where the FTC and the Justice Department were wrestling with extraordinary new uh, technologies such as the automobile, the telephone, the moving picture, the aeroplane, um, the radio. Uh, these, were all, these were all, to use a modern phrase, disruptive technologies in their, in, their, in, their, in their own way. Competition laws always had a hard time looking ahead and making good judgments about what those changes are going to make, mean. To me, what's necessary with the greatest urgency in this area is that when you do make these judgments and predictions, you go back and ask, how did it actually turn out? All right. My, yeah, and I think that that's all right. But that was really a case of, I think, screw up on uh, Google and their lawyers' part. They were going to win that case on fair use. It was no doubt. I am, there's almost no one who's bigger on copyright than me, and I thought it was a fair use. Uh, there's some, so I, I had no doubt that they would win that. So then, what are they trying to do? Then settle. What they should have done is said, okay, we're going to win this case. Boom. We could, they could have got all that settlement agreement through contracts. 
but they got, they got, I don't know, um, greedy and said, okay, we'll settle because we're afraid of a fair use decision, but we're going to load it up with all sorts of stuff which have no, a lot of people who are not before the court are bound by. So Judge Chin, he didn't really do it on any technical. He's saying these people aren't before this court. You're legislating almost, and this is just unfair. So his was more of a gut reaction. This is unfair. I'm not going to allow it. If they had simply said, okay, let's fight it out, they could have gotten everything in that settlement agreement from people just through contracts. So I think it was, it was bad strategy on behalf, or maybe it was, you know, it was Google pushing it rather than the lawyers, but I think they could have gotten it if they simply did it uh, in a straightforward way, and the reason it was rejected um, was of the unfairness the parties not before it. So what happens? They go up in the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals says, what are you doing, Denny Chen, with this case talking about settlement? Remanded and said, make a fair use determination, which basically they on their own, it wasn't even argued on appeal, thought it was fair use. Just get rid of this case. They remanded for fair use. So that shows how clear to most people, players in the thing, that this was a fair use. They didn't even want to bother, waste time on a settlement, because you're going to get rid of the case with fair use, and that's what they remanded, and that's what he did. All right, thank you. Next question. Uh, Dolly? Just hang, hang on for the mic, please. Alternatively, you can say your question and I'll repeat it for you. I'm Judith Hamill. I'm Director of Government Relations here at the John Marshall Law School. I am not a lawyer. I'm an urban planner by training. So my question is more a policy one. The new trade agreement that's happening between us and uh, the uh, Asian countries. TPP. Uh, what, what impact will that have on intellectual property rights in that region? Go ahead. Yeah, I think actually it's a great treaty. Uh, the compromises, of course, but it's going to be helpful to the United States. It's going to help to do small business in the United States. Uh, what the people who are objecting to is this little provision, this little provision in IP or whatever, uh, which I think most of them are, f are, are fine. I mean, I, it's a miracle to get it. It's tremendously difficult in this age for every one of these countries to make concessions. And, and, they, you, and they got it, which is tremendous success. And now it comes back and, and uh, Hatch says, oh, you know what? The law says 12 years for this data or whatever, and this says only eight years. Um, maybe we shouldn't have it all. Are you kidding? You get it nowhere in the world. You're getting eight years. You're getting 12 years here. Maybe through bilaterals you could get 12. The, the objectors to this are not in the real world. And what it happens is the clients or the stakeholders and this just have this tunnel vision of this, 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 this. And that's what a legislature or an NGO or something listen to. It's crazy. This TPP is, is really good for this country. It's, our problem is we allow a lot of stuff in already. Other people are not allowing our stuff in. So this is breaking barriers to our goods, especially small companies who don't have people overseas who can bargain and do all these other things. And so it, it's, it's a big plus. Uh, the idea that it was done in secret. Are you kidding me? A treaty was done in secret. What treaty was not done in secret? That's exactly how every single treaty is done. Why? Because you can't, once you say something publicly, you can't go back on it. So you can't have compromise. So I'm going to say this in secret. I can change this in secret. Our Constitution was completely secret. We wouldn't have a Constitution to this day if there was transparency. Transparency is used to kill something. The people who are using transparency to kill this, they didn't use transparency to use Obamacare or other things. No transparency, but they like the result. So when you hear people saying it should be more transparent, what they really want to do is kill it, because when you're transparent, you can't get the deal done. Bill, do you want to say something I, about due process and antitrust? Uh, I, I was just going to, to, going to say uh, in our um, modern environment, I, I don't know that there's the political will to take what I agree with you as a a wonderful achievement and make it so. Um, 
It is, uh, it's an environment in which there's such uh, deep-seated skepticism about the benefit of markets, the benefit of trade. I don't know that uh, TTP will succeed or its uh, transatlantic counterpart as well. To me, it's very sobering that the former Secretary of State, who was an enthusiastic supporter of the Pacific Agreement, expresses reservations now. And she's not alone. Uh, it's a hard, hard road to travel to make it, uh, to make it work. Uh, if it doesn't work, that's a grim sign for the future. Yeah, and what I have to say is I, happen to, I, I have been historically a big fan of the former Secretary of State. Uh, uh, and I don't know what's going on with her, but what's really what's going on is where is Obama? Usually the president is out front a long time at all these stages saying how great this is, not just to the public, but in Congress, and he's been absent. Now they're working it like crazy, but he's been absent. So other people sneak in. If he was strong all along against this, the chance of Hillary Clinton going against it would be small, but he hasn't have a, he doesn't have a footprint in this, so she can do it, and no one says, "Oh my God, she's dissing Obama." No, so people are getting away with this stuff because from the executive, not the people, uh, U.S. Trade Representative Pro Beer. Great, I really think it's the executive. Obama has fallen down on this, and which, which he realizes it, it's a. It's a, it's a big deal, and he could have done a lot more on it. So I hope it does pass, but I think you're right. The fact that it might be in jeopardy. Another thing around the world, we can't pass this? The whole world recognizes how good this is. It makes us look like idiots. And well, maybe we are idiots. Maybe that's the lesson. The, the ambivalence fuels resistance in other countries, too. That is, if, if the U.S signals through its political process that it thinks this is a doubtful proposition or harmful, uh, that truly emboldens dissent that exists elsewhere. And there's a real stratum of concern for the same reasons. That is, the, the ambivalence about trade, the ambivalence about competition uh, is, uh, is deep-seated in many areas. And if the, if the U.S. wavers on it and says we're not so sure, or says no, uh, that's easily mobilizes resistance elsewhere. And, and what does that say? There's no coalition of willing. It used to be, you follow the United States, you're going to be okay. The United States does it, that's basically a protection against other people going against you. When, when we do stuff and then can't do it, when Obama goes to South Korea to sign a trade agreement and the president refuses to sign it for his trip, for all these little slights and everything, and it, it, it just is cumulatively the United States is now not going to have input and, and, and power. Uh, power is something that is given. It's not just taken. It's given to you by other people. They don't have to follow you. And so this is, I think, an indication of, and if you talk to the people around the White House, he's not interested in things. Very few things he's interested in. He's got a staff that's tremendously interested in things. But he isn't. And that's where presidential when you talk about foreign things, Presidential leadership is very important. Right, so intellectual property rights is an important part of the TPP. I think under, uh, amongst any trust commentators, due process and the effect of uh, the TPP on emerging countries with the competition regimes is another. So that's a footnote to the dis T TPP discussion. What do you think of the TPP? Do you have any views? I, I think it's good in principle. Whether it works in practice remains to be seen. You sound like Hillary Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next uh, question. Yep. You, you can speak there or you can come up to the mic. It's up to you. Okay. Why don't you come up to the mic, all right? Because we have a... This is being broadcast to the world. I realize now, unfortunately, I just realized that... Uh, okay, I'm uh, Francisco Espinoza. I'm a 2L here at John Marshall. So my question may be... Uh, a little uninformed. I was curious about after the activist decision and Justice Breyer's uh, not making pay for delay systems in the pharmaceutical industry. Not making what? The pay for oh, yeah, delay. Okay, okay, okay. I was just wondering what uh, the implications were after that case and I guess the policing of 
pay for delay systems and they weren't made unlawful in that case? It's certainly given a real shot in the arm to the FTC's enforcement program. Uh, I'd, I'd say that uh, the, um, on the enforcement side, it's energized the pursuit of the cases that are, that are still in process. Uh, a big focus of attention is what types of proof shift the burden of coming forward to the defendants? Uh, is it to show, uh, show the, the sum that was paid? Is it, uh, is it to, to demonstrate uh, an imbalance in apparent consideration? Uh, is, that, is that what it takes? Uh, uh, my, my impression also from, from acquaintances who counsel companies is that uh, this is, a, this is a caution light uh, that for a long period of time, the advice could be very aggressive because the jurisprudence seems so favorable uh, here. Here it's, uh, it's more of a source of caution. You saw that the FTC got a fairly spectacular settlement in one of its cases, but that was principally the result of what was acknowledged to be fraud on the patent office. That was the, that was the ingredient that, that motivated the settlement, uh, a huge sum, uh, not necessarily just the pay for delay allegations in the case. Um, but uh, so I think, I think two things have happened. Agency, more bold more aggressive, more determined to press home the cases that it's got, got remaining. Uh, probably more determined to look for more cases. Uh, um, uh, business counselors, more cautious in telling firms what to do. My sense is that if the, if the FTC wants to, ad again, to address the ambiguities in activists, and activists is the, the majority opinion is clearly a compromise. When you go back to older decisions like California Dental and you see the ambivalence of the court majority over what the rule of reason means, what evidence has to be introduced in order to shift the burden of coming forward with, 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 uh, with justification evidence. Um, Justice Kennedy is the vote that, that, that switched uh, between those, is a vote, a crucial vote that switched between those cases. Justice Bryerson called me up and said, this is what I was doing. But my, my guess is, is that he would have written an opinion with, with more clearly defined footholds, presumptions spelled out more, but doing so would have cost him a majority, and he didn't do it. That's why, that's why the opinion is so hazy on the question of what the analytical framework is. M my sense is that if the, if the FTC wants to have a key role in providing that clarity, it's got to start another case inside through its administrative process where the commission writes the opinion that says, this is the template looking ahead. Uh, uh, with the expectation that that makes its way through the, through the long running appellate process that Hugh described before uh, in, in three to five years and that you get back up the street to the big court uh, uh, if you're really fortunate by the end of the decade but early in the next. Yeah, I think, uh, I think, I, yes, I think uh, that's correct, but there is, there is uh, if I was the FTC, I'd be a little worried because basically they skated on this. They wanted, they didn't get what they want. What did they want? Uh, they wanted a presumption of illegality. Yeah, they, what uh, is uh, that they, called? Uh, they, wanted, they wanted, within a rule of reason framework, they wanted the court to clearly say, the, the fact of such a payment creates a presumption of illegality, but it's rebuttable. So not a per se violation, Actually, the early briefing and the early cases said something close to per se illegal. Uh, but the fallback advance to the court was treat this as presumptively illegal, the burdens on the defendant to justify. Which is called quick look. Yeah. Right? Which now just. Yeah. See, so it goes up there, and they want that. Uh, and they, uh, they've lost an 11th Circuit, both in a district court and a court of appeals. Uh, Supreme Court, these justices, if I'm Kennedy, if I'm Ginsburg, I think this is a compromise. They didn't get the quick look. We got real reason. And you know what? In real reason, normally, the defendant wins. So the mentality of it was, this is not going to be the end of pay for delay, but you can, might get rid of bad pay for delay. No. Uh, now, it goes down, and you can see in the courts. District court, you know, finds reasons to okay it, or actually goes further and says, no cash, no anything, uh, it's, it's almost per se. So it's a, a litmus test for what you think about IP, what do you think about patents. If you're really suspicious, everything else, this is just bad people 
doing bad things. If you believe in patents, this is people trying to do the right thing that the law gives them, and they're being prohibited for no good policy reason. And that's how it has to be fought out, even to this day. It can't be doctrinally this is this and, and Breyer said this. Um, and I think if you stay in the Third Circuit, uh, it has two district court opinions yeah. going up right now. I can't see the Third Circuit uh, not uh, reversing for the same reasons that they, they uh, have done in the past. Think, and then think about Third Circuit. There's a, what, the Circuit Pride. Believe it or not, there's circuit pride no uh, that we're doing things right and everything else. And this is their moment. This is the Third Circuit's moment. Yep. They're not going to change ships. And, and, you know, the defendants in this case made a motion to transfer it to the Federal Circuit. I mean, talking about a wasted motion, there's no chance. Why? Because there's patent things involved. So doctrinally, it, it could make some sense. And a lot of circuits would transfer it because they would just want to get rid of the case. But not this. This is our baby. And you know what? You're in our net now. Yes. Uh, and we're in control. And you're okay. We are at time. And I do want to give uh, those of you who are here today some time with our speakers over the wine reception. So a couple of announcements before we conclude. Next February, we're going to have our annual uh, IP conference. It's our 60th year. You're all very welcome to join us. Uh, the Registrar of Copyrights, Maria Palante, Assistant USTR Probia Meta, who represented the United States in TPP negotiations in the, for the IP provisions, have in principle agreed to join us next year as well. So uh, stay tuned for and details. And those are two great, great people. It's great that you got them to, to come here. Yeah. So thank you all very much for coming. Please join me in thanking our speakers. Thanks so much. We are adjourned.